Welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most interesting topics in the world of Indiana basketball. This is our 163rd edition of Assembly Call Radio, and it is our 609th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of Thursday, April 2nd, 2020. I am your host, Jared Morris. And let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call, how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud banner moment. And Indiana is the national champion. When it comes down, Indiana will be champion. Smart takes the shot. Oh, oh Hoosiers have won the national championship. This week's banner moment occurred a couple of days ago when someone listed in a single tweet all of the national championships that have been won by Big Ten teams. And let's face it, it's sad that the entire list can fit into one tweet. But here it is. 1940, Indiana. 1941, Wisconsin. 1953, Indiana. 1960, Ohio State. 1976, Indiana. 1979, Michigan State. 1981, Indiana. 1987, Indiana. 1989, Michigan. And 2000, Michigan State. So if you're scoring at home, that's 10 total national championships for the Big Ten, half of which have been won by the Hoosiers. And one of the others, the 1960 Ohio State title, included Bob Knight as a player. Not to mention, Michigan's title in 1989 has a big cream and crimson asterisk next to it because J. Edwards and the Hoosiers beat them twice that season. And for the record, no, we're not counting Maryland's title in 2002 because they were in the ACC then. And if Tom Coverdale had been healthy, I mean, who knows? Maybe it's title number six for Indiana. Anyway, what's the point of all this? The point is that the Big Ten hasn't won a title since the year 2000. That's 20 years. Now, would that streak have been broken this season? No one will ever know, of course, but I personally think there was a decent chance because I think Michigan State was ready to make another deep tournament run. And with 10 out of the 64 teams, the conference certainly had enough lottery tickets to make it interesting. And if Devontae got hot enough, I mean, you know, I don't know. Let's just let that thought linger. The bottom line is that the Big Ten is going to win another title at some point. And when that happens, the historical odds suggest that Indiana is more likely than anyone else to do it. Plus, the last two times there was a drought of 12 or more years, it was the Hoosiers who had to step up and break it. So, enough's enough. It's time for the Big Ten to step up and win another title. And if no one else is going to do it, Archie, then damn it, it's time for Indiana to put the conference back on its shoulders and do what it does better than anyone else. All right, now let me introduce my esteemed co-host for this week's show. Ryan Phillips is off tonight probably re-watching Tiger King or arguing with someone on Twitter about why Tony Gwynn was a better hitter than their favorite player. San Diego chicken <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> mm-hmm. But here with me to my left, it's America's most fun-loving bracketologist. You'll have fun, fun, fun. fun. Fun, fun, fun. Fun, fun, fun. Fun, fun, I sat around to drink beer and watch basketball today. Fun. fun Sounds like a productive fun. use of time, Andy. What's your bottom line on the last week in Indiana basketball? If only more days had been spent doing that. Although, to be fair, I have been doing that as part of the rewatch series, just not live basketball. So <laughs> not not too far off, I guess. But, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, obviously not a ton to, to talk about uh, current current news wise with IU, but it, it has been really fun getting to, to go back and participate in and listen to some of these rewatch shows. Uh, it's proven to be a pretty good way to uh, pass the time or at least get your basketball fix uh, in the meantime. And and like I said, they've been fun to to be a part of and to watch and relive. And uh, some of them have made me go and you know, watch the next game down the line uh, in terms of that. So I'm partway through the uh, the 92 uh, Elite Eight game so far after watching uh, after watching them you know beat Shaq and and listen to that. So it's it, it has spun up a lot of fun projects that I think you know that we had wanted to do for a while. Uh, I've enjoyed the Crimson Cast series where they've been going into some of the hypothetical questions. It's been good. Galen uh, pulled together the long-awaited Bloomington Restaurant podcast that has, uh, that has gotten started, which I, I had some audible laughter to today while I was listening to uh, when I was doing some work. So, um, you know, not all is uh, not all is lost. We're all uh, on, on here healthy and uh, trying to find productive or not really even that productive ways to pass our time, but at least entertain ourselves. So it's been uh, good to see some things spun up and I certainly hope everybody's doing well uh, out there and staying safe and, and healthy with their families and making the best of this time, which I think we're all, all trying to do. Absolutely. All right. And to my right. He remembers the days when a movie cost a dollar. Heaven help you if you ever decide to pop your collar. Play hard, but 
remember fake hustle is a crime. He's the coach and it's time so time. Beer, cheese curds, and music. It doesn't get any better. Coach, it's Tonsoni time. What's on your mind? Uh, just glad to be back here on a Thursday. Uh, much needed time with uh, you guys uh, in this time of quarantine. And um, it just gives us something to think about and talk about. And, and looking forward to after the show today when uh, our my good friend Richie uh, is going to be uh, brought on. But, uh, you know, there was some interesting news. Uh, Pigs had some interesting news on, on recruits. And, and with this uh, non, the dead period being uh, extended, how it may hurt a school who, who can't get uh, an official visit in, and it may help a school, specifically Indiana, with another recruit. Uh, the Duncham and the Kaufman situations are too different because players can't go on these official visits, and if they're leaning somewhere right now without these officials, it, it's not a chance for the tide to turn. And I think all schools involved will have some bonuses in that and have some uh, negatives in that. And we'll see, for, especially for those young men who want to announce here in April or May heading in. And, and we'll also see how many of those recruits will just say, OK, uh, we're going to let this uh, whole situation play out. And then we'll uh, be be more likely to announce uh, in, in the fall when school gets back, if, if it does get back. So that's a basketball thing uh congratulations in the 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 elite eight for the indiana hoosiers and the one online simulation uh that was good to see uh brought back some some good thoughts i really appreciate all of um our hoosier nation here assembly call nation uh with the with the rewatch just really good basketball uh and and a shout out to our community online too uh with the mighty networks uh it, it really means a lot for people wanting to ask questions and be able to provide some questions through coach's corner so even though even though this is a tough time and and sports have been canceled there's still a lot to talk about and think about for indiana basketball well said coach all right well here's what we will talk about this week we'll go through some a lot of hoosier headlines frankly but we will go through some big 10 headlines uh and just kind of some general headlines that are out there uh, and then in our main segment, segment two tonight, we're going to talk about defining moments of the 2019-20 season for a handful of Hoosier players, lifting this from a good article that I saw in uh, from the Hoosier Network. And so we're going to talk about that and go player by player through some of their defining moments for this season. Uh, and then, of course, we'll answer your questions in segment three. All of that coming this week on Assembly Call Radio. Before we get to all that, uh, we do want to let you know about what is going on this weekend with the rewatch. So the first two weekends of the rewatch, uh, we went Friday, Sunday, uh, because that was you know kind of what the, the normal first couple weekends of the NCAA tournament would be. But now it's time for the Final Four and the championship, and so we are going Saturday, Monday. So Saturday night, starting at 8 o'clock Eastern, we will re-watch the IU-UNLV game from 1987. Absolutely one of the most fun IU games ever, one of the best coaching jobs that, that Coach Knight did and a career filled with them. Uh, but that's a really fun game. And then we are actually going to do all three national championship games. So we'll do the 1976 game on Monday, and then the week after that, we'll do Saturday, Monday again, and do the 1981 championship in 1987. But this week, uh, Saturday, it's IU UNLV, and then Monday night, it'll be the IU Michigan 1976 national championship game when Indiana clinched the uh, the national championship. So you can go to assemblycall.com slash rewatch to get the YouTube links for those. We'll just do a synchronized live rewatch uh, starting at 8 Eastern and then do a post-game show afterwards. So it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, and of course, in the meantime, make sure that you support our friends at homefieldapparel.com. You can use the promo code assembly20 if you want to get 20% off there. And then if you want to support a local food bank, go to foodpantries.org or feedingamerica.org. Uh, food banks oftentimes pick up the slack for families. You know, Parents have lost their jobs. Kids are out of school. Harder to to you know to put consistent meals on the table. Food banks pick up that slack, and so it's a great way uh, to support them and support the families in your local area. All right, guys, well, let's talk about a few of the headlines uh, that we do have to discuss this week. The first one is that the NCAA is not going to grant additional eligibility to winter sport athletes. I think we all assumed that that would be the case, uh, but they are going to grant another year of eligibility for spring sport athletes, coach, um, which. I, you know, I think I I think I agree with this decision because the winter sport athletes, even though it stinks that they didn't get to play in you know in the championships, they did get to play most of their seasons. Um, but you know, the spring sport athletes basically were going through practice and that's it. And so I can see why they made the distinction, why they decided to do it that way. Um, and of course, all of this is pending. <laughs> You know, just when sports and everything can kind of resume again, and what the financial situation is going to look like for colleges at that point. Um, but 
it seems like a decision that makes sense. Do you agree? Absolutely. Uh, there's going to need to be some further discussion about roster size and limits and scholarships. You know, some of the smaller um, sports have limited scholarships that they split up 25% and 50% scholarships to their players. How is that going to uh, happen when roster construction, you now have five years of, of student athletes in your track program, uh, in your baseball, softball program. So there needs to be some additional but, you know, sometimes us in education, we do things that are, are right for kids and students uh, instead of what's right for money and, and, and testing and everything else, not to get political about education. But uh, I think taking something away for health reasons uh, and then allowing them to come back if they choose is just simply the right thing. As far as the winter athletes, they had a full season, uh, just their, their final um, tournament, and a lot of teams were already – uh, had the season completed if they had played their conference tourney, uh, Missouri Valley for, um, you know, if you got beat in the first round of Missouri Valley, their season is our, was already over. So any senior in, in those situations already had their eligibility. So I think it's good, and and, and sometimes the NCAA actually does some, something that makes sense. Andy, do you agree? Yeah, I think, yeah, as we talked about this before, it just opened up so many – different loopholes for, for people just in terms of what coach said, you know, some of the conference tournaments were over. So, you know, those players, technically they played out their season, but then you get, you can't really get yourself into the situation where you're saying, well, it's okay for you and not for you. And uh, I think what that would do from like a grad transfer perspective, that would just be a, even more of a free for all than it probably already is. And uh, yeah, it just seemed like a lot of logistical things with scholarships out there. I think they're going to need to handle that in the, in the spring sports as well, but that makes a lot more sense of, you know, some of the you know the baseball team had played a handful of games, but they were, you know, really scratching the surface of the number of games they play over the course of the season. So um, while, you, you know, you do feel for some of the guys that, that didn't get a chance to truly finish out their careers, I think it made sense and uh, probably will be avoiding some odd scenarios um, that, that it would have created. Yeah. You know, and then we have to talk about the fact that Indiana has canceled all campus events through July 31st. I think this is pretty much happening on most college campuses. You know, coach high school, the the entire the rest of the academic year is canceled, right? In for Indiana high schools. Um, yep. you know, and I know a lot of people are asking yep. in the chat and have been asking on Twitter, you know, what does this do for Christian Landers reclassification? Because, you know, that's the most important thing right now. And really from an Indiana basketball thing, it actually is <laughs> the most important thing right now. Um I haven't heard anything that suggests that it will change it. I guess, you know, obviously he would have to be able to do those classes online because there aren't going to be any in-person classes. But from everything I've heard, it's still on track to happen. And I guess until I hear something different, I'm going to assume that that's the case and just hope that everything is, you know, good to go for the fall um, when students would enroll and school would get back to normal again. Um, do you guys have any reason to feel differently? No, because I think this semester is going to count for Indiana high school students that you're not going to lose credit uh, because of going to remote learning. Uh, what we're doing with our seniors and up up in the air, we have a um, cohort meeting tomorrow via Zoom uh, to talk about how to handle the seniors and, and make sure that they get the credits that they need to graduate. And I think um, Christian Lander, his coach, his, his counselors all are aware of what he wants to attempt to do. Usually in a reclassify, there is a, a number of the fourth year credits of a math class or an English class or something that need to be done that maybe a junior has not uh, taken yet as a regular class. And there are all kinds of online classes through universities, through other uh, means where people who want to push ahead uh, we, we do it a lot in our school for military, people who want to go into military by December. Uh, we get them some online classes. So they're reclassifying back a half a year so they can get to their military commitment. Uh, and I assume that um, regardless of the cor coronavirus thing, that if he was going to classify, he's probably going to have to take some things online. And I imagine that's all still in play. Yep. Um Andy, you know, the other thing that we have seen happen, obviously, you know, you're still seeing lots of kids across the country enter the transfer portal and you're seeing some kids commit different places. Uh, but you're also seeing uh, really good players in the conference and throughout the country declare their intentions for whether they're going to go pro or whether they're going to stick around. 
Uh, and we've had, you know, in terms of just comings and goings in the Big Ten, Cam Mack from Nebraska has announced that he's transferring. Uh, he's a guy who played really well against Indiana, so I cannot say that I'm sorry to see him go. Uh, but that is, uh, you know, Nebraska obviously is still a program very much in flux as Fred Hoiberg rebuilds things there. But in terms of guys who have said that they're going to go pro, and I think all these guys have said that they're going to, you know, have a certified agent so that they can come back if they want to. But Caleb Wesson from Ohio State, Isaiah Livers from Michigan, Xavier Tillman from Michigan State, Cam Mack, um, I mentioned him, right? Yeah, I mentioned Cam Mack, uh, Daniel Oturu, and Marcus Carr. So they have all said they're going to go pro. We have not yet heard from, I don't think, but correct me if I'm wrong, Luca Garza, Jalen Smith, Io DeSunmu, uh, Kofi Coburn, Aaron Henry, and obviously Trace Jackson Davis, who... You know, I think he'll be back next year, but I would not be surprised if he at least declared his attention, his intentions to kind of get that feedback. Um, any of those surprise you? Which ones do you think are the most notable? Uh, I mean, I think of the ones that you haven't heard from. Uh, Desunmu seems incredibly likely to go. I would assume Jalen Smith is in the same boat. Although, you know, you have so many questions this, this year about how everything that's going on is going to impact the deadlines, you know, what's going on with the NBA season, how will they even determine the draft order? How does the, you know, kind of pushing back of all that, how does that impact the draft and those kind of timelines? So that's a little bit up in the air, but I, I, you know, of the two of the guys that we hadn't heard from, those seem the two most likely to go pro. Um, I would assume that Garza would be, would be back, but uh, you never really know. And then of the guys putting their names in, I think all of those generally make sense. Um, you know, the ones that maybe you raise an eyebrow to or Cam Mack and Marcus Carr putting their names in, but there's really nothing. There's really well, no Matt, Mack is transferring. I misspoke there. He's just okay. transferring. Well, he may be putting his name in the draft as well. Who knows? Um, yeah. <laughs> I think but, he is. Yeah, oh, he's doing, doing both. Yeah, yeah, oh, I'm not sure, doing both. yeah, I'm not sure that your your list was, was wrong in that regard. So okay, I, well. Um, but I mean, you really look a lot of the big men of, of the, of the players who have put their names in between Wesson, uh, livers more of a stretch for obviously Xavier Tillman, Oturu, uh, being there. If Jalen Smith does put his name in, I think Coburn would be wise to come back, uh, at Illinois, but you, you know, you're going to go, you lose a lot of good big guys from a league that, that had a ton of them a year ago, but I don't know that any of those necessarily stand out as surprising. I would be surprised if Carr kept his name in, but I, I don't know that I would be shocked to see any of the any of the other guys um you know not not stay in um that are on that list but uh yeah it, it's i uh, it just everything's so in flux with the timelines of all this stuff and a ton of transfers and you know you've got a few grad transfers who have already you, are narrowing lists down and whatever but man it's a just to to put yourself in that situation to unless you really knew somebody at a school who'd either recruited you someplace else or you had knew somebody on the team it's awfully hard to go and be making those decisions right now when you can't do visits and you can't yeah. do all those other things. And, and yeah, you can talk to people and do video conferences and, and everything else. But I, I do think um, it's just an odd time where you see some guys seeming to really rush forward with making some decisions and narrowing lists and then others hanging back a little bit. So it's nobody knows exactly how long the off season is going to be and when it's, you know, it's, it's started, but, but in terms of, you know, the movement, the, the draft, those kinds of decisions and timelines, it's going to be a, a weird one for sure. And then you've got the situations where you don't know how many scholarships you have. Do you have late signees? Do you have different things like that? So it's just going to be a wild, uh, a wild off season, which um, given how little activity everyone seems to generally be doing it, there's going to be a lot of activity kind of being done blind in some of these scenarios. And yeah. always curious to see how that shakes out. And, and you worry that maybe there'll be some decisions that don't end up being the right ones because you couldn't really get the full gamut of information that you're used to getting, whether that be draft evaluations or meetings with potential, you know, places that you transfer to or just different things like that. So um, you'd like to think that things will work out in a way that people can get the information they need, but uh, it, it's, it's tough to see that working out in every case that, the way things sit right now. It definitely does. You know, it's, I don't know if you guys feel this way. I mean, you know, we're sitting here at the beginning of April and the college basketball season always seems a long way off, you know, at this time of year, whether we've had an NCAA tournament or not. But it feels especially like like just way out there because, you know, obviously we have to get through football season first. And that feels like it's so in flux right now. You know, if because, anything moves at the pace that the last three weeks have, everything yeah, is a long way. Yeah. Next Wednesday is a long way I know. off at that point. <laughs> That's what I mean. You know, so you start talking about these decisions that are going to get made and what's everything going to be like by November, and it feels like ten years from now. 
You know, and I think the the biggest thing that's going to be interesting to watch now as we move forward, just from a sports perspective, obviously it's, you know, what happens with the professional sports leagues. But man, from a college perspective, you know, A, is the college football season going to be able to start on time with actual games? And will they be able to have fans? Because one, like if I had to guess right now, it seems likely that they'll find a way to play. You know, who knows? But it really seems hard to fathom that we'll be ready by... August for you know getting hundreds of thousands of people together and as you start reading some of the articles about how much of an and I think most people kind of understand this how much money is generated by football how much it means for athletic departments I mean if if football can't be played with fans and how much money is generated there and how much that money is counted on it's really going to have a long-term impact on not just football, but all of college sports I mean that is really something to watch because it's not necessarily a basketball story but it is something that will affect all of sports. And, you know, it's we sit here on the on you know the first of April, we're all just trying to get through, you know, to next week. So who knows what it'll be, but it's certainly worth keeping an eye on. And there are plenty of pessimistic opinions about it out there. So, you know, none of us know for sure, but it's definitely worth watching. Um, any other final thoughts, guys, before we move along? No, I would just um if any of these guys listen, I would encourage everyone on that list, except Trace Jackson Davis, to go ahead and go to the G League and to the pros. It is your time. Um, take it from a coach. I've seen you play. Uh, you're ready to go, um, and, and I wish you well, and congratulations on being a successful college player. <laughs> coach is ready to just get them all out of here. Get them it's all out. It's use time. Let's go. It's, 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 a few other people we could maybe add to that list, too, while we're at it, but we'll work on that during the break. <laughs> you know, I, I will say, I mean, you know, with so much flux and with, you know, the potential for off-season work, you know, time to work together to be less, there could be a real value in continuity. You know, if you just bring the same group back, you may be further ahead than teams that have a bunch of new guys and those guys can't really work out together and do some of that stuff. You know, and Indiana does project to have, you know, a lot of continuity from this year to next year. So that could be one thing working in Indiana's favor. On a quick serious note, as a coach, I would I would tell a player that, you know, if, if this is your time, like a Luca Garza, I don't know how much better he can play uh, as a senior. And if his goal was to play professionally, it might be his time to go. And I think good coaches will be honest with their players. Yes, you'd love to have Luca Garza back to play. It's going to make you look better, your press conferences, all that better. But if you're in it for the right reasons, you've got to tell some players um, – and be honest with them, and I think the really good coaches uh, do have that in mind. That's always interesting for me from a coaching standpoint to watch how coaches handle that. And you don't get into the conversations in the meeting rooms and that, but you can just tell those coaches who are like, you know what, man, it's time for you to go. We, we love you. We'd love to have you back versus those coaches who might be a little more selfish uh, and, and try to keep keep a player so that they have a little bit easier year. But all of those people on that list are really good basketball players from a really good league, and, and you do wish them well uh, regardless of, of, of their decision. Coaches can't – like, he can't actually insult a player and just let it linger. If he insult, He's going to come back a few minutes later, and he's going he's gonna to make it right, you know? <laughs> he, can't, he can't give bad advice. He can't insult a player. He's always going to come back. That's, I'm too genuine. That's the heart of a coach. That's what we love about you, Coach. Uh, okay, coming up – Let's reflect a bit on last season, and we're going to go player by player and determine the defining moment from this season for each player. And we're going to start with the bench guys, Devontae, Duran, Demizi, Jerome, Race, and Armand. That is next. Stick with us here on the Assembly Call. All right. Yeah, the, the Garza one is interesting because I would kind of agree with you. I, I I would think he would actually come back and they could have a really good team next year if he does, but I would also agree with what you said of I'm not sure that a guy with his match of skill set and athleticism, like what is he going to do to play better than he did this year? The things that are going to hold him back are not going to change in a year and – yeah, it, it does make you wonder, but that kind of comes down to mindset at that point of what you the wonder, guy wants to do. And all absolutely, you wonder which guys on here are Jawan Morgan. You know that are good as juniors and are getting a look, but boy, if they have a good senior year, that they could either get drafted or, like Jawan did, find his way in the G League and then get up to uh, up to the league. Um, you know, the league is so tough that all, all these players are good. You think, yeah, they're. But even a guy like Desumu, who I think should probably go and will go, 
um, he could probably benefit from another year. There, there's some growth in his game yet at the college level if he wanted to do it at college. Yeah. Um, but some of these guys, it's about they want to go pro. That's their goal. Then are you ready? Go. Some of them maybe love the college life and, and want to stick around a little bit. There, there's so much into it that uh, that we don't know. But of that list, I, I'd like to. I like watching Arturo play. I like the sumo watching him, and then the rest of them can all leave. <laughs> you know, I think it, Sumo was fairly close last year, so I, that's just why I assumed he would definitely go this yeah, year. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think he's gone. gone. I, I just he's probably and I and I don't have a lot of favorite players from opponents because I want them to get beat, but he's probably the one that I enjoy the most watching play from the Big Ten. Cassius was nice too, um, but those two players right there were were really players you, you kind of rooted for. Um, when Coach likes killers. In Indiana. Coach yeah, likes I was say, yeah, the scene we just struck me as the like just rip your heart out and stomp on it, guy. So it's like how Yogi was. That's what we yeah. need. We need we need a killer. Um, Andy, I am not a hundred percent convinced makes, it, that you have the right mic chosen. Like your mic is on, I can see the light, but I feel mm. like it's I feel like your computer might be picking it up, or I oh, may just be. No, here. you're right. Yeah, we've got uh, with all the different uh, Zoom meetings and everything that is going on here, we've so. got different. Uh, so, all right, let's try this. How's there that? There we go. There Perfect. he is. Okay, I knew it. I don't know. I should. All, I need to trust my instincts on this stuff. I've no, developed we, them long we, enough. We've I had because the kids have been using it. They've been their soccer coaches have been doing stuff. Well, then Mallory had one with their friends, and I still had it set up on Loopback where I was doing the post game show. And she's on here for like twenty minutes. I'm thinking they can't hear what you're saying. Like, why are you not saying something to us? And I'm like, you know. So in a minute, I go and do that. Well, then one of them had it out doing stuff with their soccer team and whatever. So I think enough people have used everything on here that uh, all the settings are probably not what they used to be. So as soon as you said that, I was like, yep, I would guarantee you that it's probably not how it's supposed to be. The so. kids weren't playing like Ryan audio drops while they were on. On uh, no, no, they didn't. Uh, they didn't. Yeah, they didn't have the the board <laughs> up, putting throwing stuff out there. Thankfully, so. Uh, By the yeah. way, I, I, so I want to throw one more comment in here about the Garza question because he's such an interesting case to me. Because he is a guy. What th- this was his junior year, right? Last season was his junior year, so he has one more season left. I think is that correct? Yes. I, think I think that's so. correct. I mean, he is a guy with another season like what he just did is going to put his name all over record books. You know, Iowa does have a chance to be really good. Now, I question their defense. Like, can they actually be elite, like a Final Four level team? But their offense is going to be incredible. And you know, so for because because coach, what you say is right. You know, if he's ready to go and he just wants to be a professional, you know, that's fine. You know, but he's probably unlikely to be a long term NBA player. He's probably he profiles more as kind of an overseas guy. And if that is what you want to do, that's awesome. But man, if you come back for one more year, you could be a legend. Like he could, li- I mean, he could be like a Big Ten legend, like the kind of guy that they're, you know, making BTN, you know, a legend show on or whatever, and, and maybe take Iowa to a Final Four. Like, what kind of price do you pay on the potential to create those kinds of memories? You know, now not not everybody has that opportunity. Some guys are, you know, maybe they're it's earlier in their career, they haven't established themselves yet, whatever. But you know, for a guy like that, that probably isn't going to be a great NBA player. How do you value the potential for, you know, what you could do at the college level as a senior? And I don't know, that's obviously an individual question for each guy, but it would be interesting to talk to a guy like to, it would be fun to just go to dinner with Luca Garza and talk those things through with him. Cause I'd love to know what he thinks about it. Like imagine if Calvert Chaney had gone pro after his junior year, you know, like so much of the legend of Calvert Chaney, obviously he would always, he would be still one of the best players, but coming back for that senior season, what that team did, being the Big Ten's all-time leading scorer, like all of that stuff, just placed him in a whole other category. You know, now he was a lottery pick, so it's not a it's not a great comparison, and Garza isn't going to be that. But I just wonder if sometimes guys in the moment don't value enough what it would be like in twenty years to come back and be that kind of a legend. You know. No, I don't think – I think in the last 10 to 15 years, it's all about getting to the league as quick as you can and when, you, when you're when you at your apex of your ability and your draft ability. Uh, I, I, and I don't like that. Uh, I, I think college, you should stay and play, and um, I don't like people leaving early, even if I agree with them leaving early um, because I'm a college guy more than I'm a league guy, and other people enjoy the league a lot more than – in college, but I think all of these guys have some sense that they're better than they are, and, and they see that 
money, which isn't bad. It's it's lifelong money if you sign, you get drafted, you know, early and and have a guaranteed contract. So it's not really a bad decision. But I really don't think these days that they value what you're saying, Jared. Which I think all of us on the panel tonight probably value is that legend to play for your your school. And and my Garza comments come from the fact that he was good. But he was like a top five player. A lot of people thought he was player of the year. What if he's like the 15th best player next year? Uh, Does that hurt his draft stock? And if the draft is his goal, I think he's as draftable. He's got to match or get better. And he can do that. But the risk for him from NBA purposes is playing down. Yeah. um, down a year and but you you know ever since i've been on the show give me guys who want to play for indiana or or for whatever state school give me for the name of the jersey more than uh a, i'm not the indiana's not the g league getting you ready for the nba and i i just had i've had problems with that because that's my school i mean it's it, it's it's my alma mater I, I want to get back to winning championships i don't want to just say look all our guys are in the nba and we get out in the you know, the round of 32, but they, we have a lot of NBA players. That means nothing to this dude. So, yeah. No, I, and again, like, I don't, I don't think it's the wrong decision for any of these guys to go pro. I guess I just hope that they're weighting it properly. I, I just, I kind of feel like that might get on, you know, undervalued sometimes. And I think it has real value later in your life, you know, as, you know, we're getting older now and you kind of think about the things that, that really matter. And obviously getting your career started and making money certainly matters, but man, when you have a chance in your final season to do something that's really special, you know, you hope the guys really weigh that and so hopefully he does. How many guys how many guys think back of their college time more fondly than their NBA time? Like a Zeller and an Aladipo and those guys that went early and they should have. I'm not bemoaning their decision, but you know, Calbert Cheney, um, when you get back with your guys and you have a reunion and, and you know, we uh we were back in February eighth and we saw Keith Smart and those guys you know, and they're legends. That's what you're talking about. They're yeah, legends. Legends. Uh, you go to an NBA a bar in Chicago and you had a cup of coffee with the Bulls. You know, no one likes Will Purdue up in Chicago anymore. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but like, like take Yogi as an example. You know, like if Yogi, because he was thinking about going pro after yeah. his junior season, and he comes back, you see him take that next step. You know, he leads that team to a Big Ten title, something that, you know, that obviously hadn't happened in three or four years or whatever it was. Um you know, and 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 he gained that legend status. You know, so anyway, just something to think about, Luca. We'll enjoy we, we watching you our, play if you come back, and we'll wish you well in the NBA if that's what you decide to do. If Yogi doesn't come back for his senior year, we don't name our cat Yogi. I mean, it's just you know stuff like that happens when you're a college legend. That's true. That that's deep true. stuff right there. That, <laughs> <laughs> that's a ratings bomb. Gotta come just, back for the got to come back for the cat naming. If nothing yeah, else, you got to make sure that you're. There were sixty five people watching, and then that comment dropped us to forty. <laughs> nah, but you know, people people come for your hijinks. Coach. All right, I don't think that'll knock them off. Um, okay, wait till you hear Richie later. I'm looking forward to Richie. <laughs> I am looking forward to having Richie on. That'll be fun. We're doing a chat mob induction. AC after dark, after the show. Um, that'll be. It's gonna be entertaining. We got about 40 seconds before we're going to start this uh, next segment. So, Coach, if you want to say something. I was just going to say, Eric Gordon, great player, but, again, not the same as Yogi and, and those longer stays at Indiana. That speaks to what you're saying. Yeah. yeah and I think and a, a guy at his level, he, he had to go. you know. Right. But you're right. He's still – he's a legend in his own way, but it's a different way. Yep. What were we going to say, Andy? Oh, well, I'm just saying some of that stuff's come up and you guys talked about that with Bill Murphy on podcast on the brink, but the whole, you know, bracket of, of players there, it's way in some of those kinds of things. Yep. Okay, here we go. Let's do segment number two. What's going on? It's Christian Wofford. What's the only thing better than an epic buzzer beater? Celebrating it with friends afterwards. Join my guys, Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach on the assembly call after every IU game. Go Hoosiers. Talk about a four-year player who is a legend, Christian Watford. Thank you, Christian. Welcome back to the assembly call. You can find all of our content at our website, assemblycall.com. And if you ever want to join the chat mob during our unedited live broadcast, chat mobbers, or watch those replays and see all the between segment banner, then check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash assembly call. I'm Jared Morris here with Coach Brian Tonsoni and Andy Bottoms. And guys, 
you know, we're uh, searching for interesting angles to talk about here uh, as we're in the off season, obviously earlier than we had hoped to be. Uh, and I found, I, I came across an interesting idea on Twitter. So this was by Austin Render from the Hoosier Network. And he wrote a post called Defining the Biggest Moments of the 2019-20 Season for Each Indiana Hoosier. Now, as soon as I saw that, I thought it was a great idea and I thought that we should do it on the show. So I purposefully did not read the article. So I have no idea what the article was. I didn't want to be swayed by his opinions for the defining moment. So I am recommending it without actually reading the article. But Austin does good work. I'm going to trust that it's a good piece. Uh, but again, defining the biggest moments of 2019-20 for each Indiana Hoosier. We'll tweet it out. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, but I wanted to give our take on it. And then I guess we can go back and see if our picks uh, match his. And so we're going to do the defining moment for each Hoosier player and you know, context is important here because there's two different ways that you could look at this. You could say the defining moment for the type of player that they are, and that could potentially be, you know, a bad moment. Maybe if they're an underachieving player, if they're a guy who didn't have that good of a season. I thought it would be more fun and more interesting to take a, a positive approach for this and to make this the defining moment for each player that shows what they're capable of moving forward. Like, what's the defining moment where you kind of saw, oh man, this is the type of player this guy can be? You know, and if, if he can really start playing like this consistently next year, boy, that's going to be big for Indiana. So I don't know what angle Austin took with it, but that's the angle that I think we should take with it. Um, and obviously, we won't have time to get through every single player, so we'll do the bench guys this week, we'll do the starters next week, uh, and we'll go from there. So why don't we start with, you know, the guy who's played kind of defined this Indiana season, which is Devontae Green, a guy we've spent a lot of time talking about the last few weeks, and I'll go to you guys first. Andy, what what to you was the defining moment for Devontae Green this season? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we're thinking of moments in terms of specific games or actual moments within games. I, you know, For him, the games that stand out are the Florida State game and the Iowa game, to me, I, I think pretty, uh, pretty clearly. It, it's one of those, the, the Iowa game was really at a crucial time. So maybe you say that that was a defining moment because that was a game that IU really needed to win uh, at that point. But the Florida State game was important because at that point, IU was 7-0 and but hadn't really played anybody. And it wasn't super clear what this team uh, could really be. So he has you know 27 points in one and 30 in the other. Um, I, I guess I would lean the Florida State game just because it, I, I think, really ramped up excitement for the season. Um, yeah, but, I, but I was really tempted to pick the Iowa game cause it was a, a clutch performance at a really crucial time coming off of a, a four game losing streak and heading into that game against an Iowa team that was playing really well at that point. Um, hit a ton of big threes on a, on a run in the first half that really got things going. I think both these games have been some of the ones they've been replaying on BTN. So it's, it was fun to watch in these stretches where, especially in those games where they kind of splice out the, the pieces in between. So it basically just looks like every five seconds he's hitting a three. Um, <laughs> Which actually was pretty close That's to the reality. Pretty close to reality, at, yeah. At, at that point, so I'll I'll say the Florida State game for him, just because you had Oladipo on the uh, you know sitting in the front row and uh, and kind of the excitement of that game. But I think you'd be fine to pick either of those games because I think there was a lot of parallels between the way he played in, in both of those. Yeah, and maybe if you were gonna pick a single moment from that Florida State game, is when he made that one shot that kind of drew the reaction from Victor Oladipo, you know, and kind of seeing him back there for that game. You know, I think those are the two obvious moments, and I think you're probably right, Andy. But, you know, I, I can't get out of my head that stretch he had at the end of for the first half against Nebraska at the under four minute timeout when they were kind of coming back and had built a little bit of momentum. And I just, I thought it was the best stretch he played. And I, it was one of those that if you could bottle that stretch on offense and defense where he had, you know, he had five points, he had a couple of assists, he was making the right decision, he was playing hard on defense, getting deflections, like that was the guy. Like that guy right there was kind of the all Big Ten level player that you saw in little short spurts, and that if you could ever bottle, you know, would have been, you know, obviously a much better and more consistent player. We know that that was not the case, and you know that uh, that run was punctuated by you know like a thirty five foot heat check, which is the absolute greatest way. So maybe that was actually the, <laughs> the defining moment for Devonte. Uh, but I'm you know I'm choosing to hold on uh, to those few minutes, Coach, uh, in terms of just defining what he could be as a player, but frustratingly, you know, never was consistently. Yeah. For, for one moment, um, you know, the Florida state game was important because the guards weren't healthy yet. Uh, and, and he yeah. had to step up then, but you know, he did show up, um, most of the wins 
there was a lot more good Devontae than bad Devontae, even even in the games when he didn't go off for 27 or 30. And and so I know it's about a particular moment, but what Devontae's positive, uh, he's, he was just a streaky hot shooter, and there's nothing better than to see him just every game you're hoping that he would go off for three or four, and it's just one of those, it's just fun to be, yeah, and you know the next possession down, get him the ball, get him the ball, yeah, those kind of dudes. Um you, you wish it was more consistent, but it was still fun, Devonte. It was still fun when you had those moments, and you saw it even in losses. You know, when you're down deep at Maryland, and he hits four or five at the very end because he's just like, you know what, I'm going to shoot it. <laughs> and, and and you admire, you know me, you get in the paper by shooting. Uh, you don't get in the paper by passing. So you know, we talk a lot about Devonte, good and bad, because he can score. So his defining moment in his this season and for his Hoosier career were those moments where he just was on fire and his heat checks were going in, and that's that's just fun to watch. Um, those moments were – there were a lot of those moments, and just roll them into one. Heat check, central. Let's go next with his uh, classmate, Deron Davis, and you know a few moments that you could go with. Obviously, the little touch pass that he had in the Penn State game when he was backpedaling and did made the little touch pass to, to Trace Jackson Davis was a really nice play and reminded us how good of a passer he is. The one that I'm going with uh, for him, Andy, is his ninth made basket against Michigan because that's the game where he went nine for nine, scored 18 points. And even though that's a, you know, a game that Indiana got down and wasn't really that competitive in, it was, you know, he just, he looked like kind of the old Duran. He looked nimble. He looked strong. He was aggressive shooting the ball. And it's like, you know, where was that more often? You know, and he goes, and obviously Michigan had had, you know, had problems defending the post all year long. So it wasn't something he could sustain. But that again was just kind of that brief, that brief flash of, oh yeah, this guy can occasionally be elite. And unfortunately we just didn't get to see it often enough. Yeah, I think from this season that has to be it. He that was his only double digit scoring game. I think the only game he scored more than six points. It was a season high in minutes, I believe, as I'm kind of scanning through here. Um, did actually, even though his offensive rating was 173 in that game, he did have a couple games where it was actually higher than that. But uh, yeah, I think that would that would have to be the one where uh, for that moment he you know really recaptured some of the things that he did. We think back to that Duke game and. Um, some of the things that he been able to do in the post. I, I think the pass that you talked about was a good one because I think of just general traits of his play, you know, the passing and some of the footwork and stuff like that will be part of it. But in terms of an actual moment, it was being able to come out and uh, put up put up that kind of performance against Michigan, albeit as you said in a, a in a relatively poor overall effort for the team. Coach, do you agree on that one for Duran? Yeah, I, I'm going to say the touch pass because one, he was out on a break. The ball was thrown in an awkward position. He had to turn and catch and make the pass. And that just – he was so injury prone, um, and yet he was still in a position where you don't find a center out there leading the fast break and catching an outlet pass like that. But I think that just showed what he went through a, a lot in his career, and he, he made a great effort there, and it was a big play. Uh, next, let's go with Jerome Hunter. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of an interesting one. I think there are several different directions that you could go with it. For me, the play that really sticks out for Jerome is the three-pointer that he made in the middle of the second half against Penn State when IU was down six. And you'll recall, Indiana had been up early. They gave that lead all the way back, and they were getting nothing going offensively. And it just it was one of those times where you needed a Yogi Ferrell who would just kind of step up and be like, hey, I got this. I'm going to go get us a bucket. And Jerome just stepped right up and knocked down that three, really got things going again and actually punctuated it by going down on the other end, getting a deflection, uh, forcing a miss. And that kind of got Indiana back going again. It seemed like the spark that they really needed. And to me, that's when Jerome was at his best. You know, he was not a, you know, the player that you necessarily counted on from game to game, but you did at times need someone with some irrational confidence to step up. And Jerome certainly has that. Um, and, you know, over the back half of the season, the irrational confidence became more rational because he started making shots and you felt good when he would shoot it. And so that is the play that really sticks out to me from him, coach. Uh, any others stand out to you? I, I'm going to bring up um, one and I, I don't have the time and score, but I liked his post game um, when they would get the ball to him inside the post and score. I think that shows some versatility and that's another big thing for, for me and my evaluation of Indiana next year is having some people who can do multiple things. And when he started playing defense again, 
uh, or more consistently to get more minutes. Uh, and that's not just one particular defensive possession, but I thought that was a defining moment too because you saw him play more meaningful uh, time and, and moments, and, and hopefully he's a key for the years, years to come. Andy? You just muted yourself. Uh, so a couple, <laughs> everything's going great technically for me tonight. Um, yeah, yeah, a couple of the ones stick out for me in, in losses. Unfortunately, he hit a, a couple big threes in that Illinois game that ended up losing by one, uh, and scored, I think his season high 12 points in the Maryland game. Uh, and even though some of his mistakes down the stretch against the press might be the lingering thought there, he had a big part in, uh, the comeback that they had in that game. And then the other one that, I still blame I, Archie more for that than Jerome. I, I would agree with that. And uh, and then I think it was him at, toward the end of the Michigan State game that when they missed the shot, he's the guy that grabbed that last rebound after Tillman missed and then went down and made both free throws and yeah. uh, and iced it. And, and just generally with him, he just was a guy that Archie talks so much about how much he loves the game. And you can really see that with him. And you kind of see it and then retroactively go back to how much it must have killed him to really be out last year but just a guy that was typically smiling on the court and just looked like he was enjoying playing basketball which um is, is something that's been in short supply at times <laughs> over the course of our time doing the show so a, a little thing but something that did not go unnoticed well i feel bad that we're going to do race thompson without ryan being here i really i really feel like ryan should be here with the defining moment for race thompson but we'll let him catch up uh next week coach what is your defining moment for race thompson I was just going to get some stats, but I'll throw this out here anyway. I thought his play at Minnesota uh, in a key road win, I thought he was really uh, – that was, to me, his defining moment because not only was he playing minutes, but that was a really huge contribution, uh, his points and his rebounds in, in that game. I didn't call the box score up here fast enough. Uh, he was but great to me, that, that was – that's he's, he's made it. Um, and a lot of that was points around the basket – uh, and, and specifically for me is his active on the offensive rebounds. Uh, if I remember that game very uh, correctly, he was, he was very active and his hustle plays in that game and throughout the rest of the season were defining moments for me for race. Yeah. I think, I think that game is probably the defining moment for what race Thompson was this year. The moment that stood out for me when I thought about it, that I think was kind of a hint of what he can be next year, you know, cause this year he was, you know, the toughness guy on defense, kind of a garbage guy, you know, to, you know, getting his points against Penn state, we saw a little glimmer of some offense and he actually, he scored four straight points in that second half of the Penn state game. It was shortly after, or maybe even right after that three by Jerome that I mentioned, uh, one was this post move that he had where he, you know, scored with his left hand. Then another one was, you know, a hustle play and transition where he battles for the rebound, gets a put back. And look, we saw as the season went on, you know, I think the Wisconsin game was notable that he, you know, got the ball more, got it down low and wasn't as successful with some of those post moves. But if he can be a guy that can actually score in more ways than just kind of garbage time, uh, certainly, if he could step out, step out and make a three, that would be big. But if he's a guy that you could dump it down to in the post, uh, and he can score, that would really, really be helpful uh, for this Indiana team, especially without having Duran there, who was a guy that you could do that with. So that moment, Andy, to me in the Penn State game, really stood out, and I think Coach had a great one too with the Minnesota one. Uh, yeah, I think when I, I look at him, the, he was playing so well in that Michigan State game before he got hurt uh, as well. And you look back at some of the what ifs of the season. IU goes on to lose the next three games, and he still didn't really look to be himself, um, even even back in that Purdue game. But after that four game stretch, he bounced back uh, and played really well against Iowa at home as well. Had ten points, and and I think you just saw him become. I think any of the moments that we talked about was just him becoming more confident. And you wish that didn't get derailed for about four games in the middle of the season. Uh, but he was a guy they started to dump the ball into. So I think what you guys said was good. I, I thought that Iowa game he had some really solid contributions because. He was a guy both in, in that game as well as that Minnesota game that Coach brought up was defensively. He was really important, gave Trace a break from having to guard Oturu all the time um, and, and showed some of his versatility on that end of the floor. So um, I, a number of good moments for him. So I'll throw the Iowa again, one into the mix, even though I'd probably pick one of the ones you guys mentioned over that. Uh, let's go next with Armand Franklin. This one seems like probably the easiest one of the bunch. Uh, Coach, is there a particular moment that stands out to you from Armand? Well, obviously winning the Notre Dame game with a couple big <laughs> shots, that, that's a specific moment. Uh, but, but the last game of the year, uh, from playing two, four, five minutes down the stretch and having his role limited to coming out in and, and 25 minutes 
and in that, for me, getting eight rebounds, uh, being ready when your number's called for, that to me is defining, uh, as you said earlier, what this season was, was when Armand hit the three, he was up and down uh, with his play, but that's what he's capable of this year, and then what he might be capable in the future is 25 minutes, uh, hit three three three-pointers against Nebraska, uh, and had eight rebounds, and I, I know that's against Nebraska in that 11-14 matchup, and you got to take that into consideration. But for a guy who hadn't played to come out and be ready and and, and get eight rebounds, that that also is defining for me. Yeah, I, that's a great point about the Nebraska game. I mean, I think you know the three pointer that he made against Notre Dame that put Indiana up 62 to 60, which was the final score of that game. 17 points, four or five from downtown. You know, no matter how many games we play at Bankers Life Fieldhouse, he needs to play 40 minutes. Just get him on the court. <laughs> Let him play the entire game because there's a clear comfort level there. Uh, there, you know, there were a couple other moments, Andy, in Big Ten games. Michigan State was one of them. There are a couple other ones. I don't remember the specifics, but a lot of times it would happen toward the end of the first half where there would be a little bit of a lull, and Armand would get in there and get his minutes and be aggressive. And I remember specifically the Michigan State game. You know, he got the ball in the wing, noticed he had an advantage, and just drove. And I think he got fouled and scored. And you know, Indiana had been struggling a little bit offensively, so. His minutes were up and down in Big Ten play, and there were some games that he came in and didn't do much. But there there were some games where he didn't get a lot of time, but he came in and left an impact on the game. And that is defining to me because, you know, he's obviously still got some things that he needs to do. He needs to get stronger. The skills have to get better. But, Andy, you can kind of see in his mentality a guy that's got that aggressiveness, that toughness that Archie's really going to like that makes you think maybe not by next year, but as an upperclassman, I still think he profiles to be a really good rotation piece on a really good Indiana team. I think he can be that guy. Yeah, I I would agree. The things that stood out to me about him over the course of the season were his aggressiveness and that he didn't seem to shrink from big moments, maybe sometimes to his detriment where he was not afraid to take shots uh, in, in key situations. But I think with experience, you can refine that, that mentality a little bit to be a really effective one. So, um, yeah, I think you, you saw a lot of good things from him. The Nebraska game was another decent one on the road. Uh, kind of looking back, he had 8.6 rebounds, four assists, did have three turnovers, um, but but showed some moments. And I think Coach talked about the guard injuries at the beginning of the season a little bit for Devontae. And, and if you really look at his game log, that was where he picked up the bulk of his minutes over the course of the season, which – is may, is maybe minutes and time that he wouldn't have gotten if not for those injuries that put him in a position to hopefully, uh, you know, maybe that 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 led to him being able to step into some of those key moments and um and play well. So I think he'll he'll get more minutes next year as uh, the roster changes a little bit with Devontae gone and things like that. But he definitely showed enough that Nebraska game was, uh, it, you know, feels like it was a year ago uh, at this point. But uh, it, the Notre Dame one is the obvious one. Uh, in the big shot with, with the three, but I think that was another case where uh, he really stepped up and played well. And like Coach said, you looked down that game while well, he had not played much uh, at all and really played so well that he earned those minutes. And, and yes, to a certain extent, I, I used trying to rest guys and with the thought that they were going to have to play a number of games at the Big Ten tournament. But um, but yeah, uh, an impressive performance. I think he's a guy who showed you enough in year one to really be able allow you to visualize what he can become and how he can progress over the course of his career and, th- and that is exciting by the way shame on us we just talked about defining moments for armand franklin didn't mention taking charge because <laughs> that guy took a ton of he charges, took a number of charges was, yes that's that was true. that was a very defining characteristic of him that is absolutely for sure all right this segment's run a little long so demizi didn't have a ton of of defining moments obviously we'll talk about him on the podcast but i want to make sure that we have some time to answer some questions so we are going to move on to that now uh coming up in our third segment we will answer your questions we got a bunch that we couldn't get to last week so we're going to do that this week including a question about how ready next year's uh recruits are to provide meaningful minutes right away we'll break that down and more stick with us here on the assembly call Okay, so that was fifty three forty eight. Um, all right, yeah. Okay, so let's talk to Meezy real quick. Um, because quick, I, I, can I say something, Andy? Well, I want to make sure people understand. Andy brought up something that I think is really important about Armand. He did not hesitate. The real shame this part isn't going to be on the radio. I mean, really. I'm sorry, but <laughs> I know we were running out of time. But th- this was really good. No, you're uh, good. I'm this is really good stuff. Armand wasn't afraid. 
And a lot of times it was to his detriment, taking quick threes or putting his hands on defensively and, and closing out too short. Um, but that really excites me as a coach uh, for what he can do, uh, his growth from freshman to sophomore year. And those are things, uh, Andy, that I don't think a lot of people – uh, may recognize, and I just when you said that, it just made a lot of sense to me that he was aggressive. And some of the things that bother the good fans of Indiana are some of those people who take possessions off or or show a little bit of uh, pouting head down stuff. And we won't re you know litigate that, but I don't think Armand's that. Armand's there to play for Indiana. You see it from the way he was raised and his mom and everything. And I I see. Like the Hunter kid at Purdue grew so much from freshman to sophomore year. And one of the things that Coach Painter said in one of the interviews when I was in there, he said, you learn by playing. Uh, and, and he's learned now as a sophomore, at the beginning of his sophomore year, to play. And we just couldn't get him minutes uh, as a younger guy. And, and so that growth is there for some of these players. Uh, but, Andy, I thought that was really, really good. And that's what coaches look for, too, is – and that's why I brought up the Nebraska thing. He was ready. He wasn't pouting. He wasn't going yep. in trying. You know, he played hard and aggressive every time he was in. And boy, you can Archie can do a lot with that. Well, it's it's funny because watching some of these um, watching some of these older games makes you think about. And I, I think I brought this up on the one when we did the the Louisville game last week. It was like watching Greg Graham in that game versus watching freshman year Greg Graham was like a, just a completely different player. Um, and so I'm not comparing Armand to him, but like Greg Graham was just like athletic, but wildly out of control as a, as a freshman, I, at least as I recall it, it's been quite a while now for me to attempt to recall it. But, um, I just remember him, like you could kind of see the flashes and you, you knew that there was something, but he just didn't know how to play within that system at that level. <laughs> whatever and so the way that he was able to kind of rein that in but then you still saw the aggressiveness when you'd go to that Louisville game and he wasn't afraid to push the ball and really attack people and go to the basket but he found a more effective way to channel his aggressiveness and so you, you kind of look at some of that and, and you look at Armand as a four-year guy and you know just to go back to some of our you know our prior conversation around well do these guys really uh, you know, who are they ready to leave? What, what can somebody become over the course of four years? Like he, he's a guy that you can see being there for four years, but you see enough of the underlying skills and mentality that if you can shape the other stuff around it and just get the natural progression of skills and, and comfort level and all those kinds of things, like it's, it's exciting to think about how good he can get. I think a lot of people would say the same thing about fantasy last year, although he wasn't as, as maybe overly aggressive as you might have categorized Armand at points this year, but you, it's that same kind of thing where like you can see the tangible skills and mindset and things that Archie wants that if he can cultivate that over the course of a few years, will turn into a really, really effective player for the system that may not translate to much of anything at the pro level, but within the system can be really good. So let's talk before we move on to segment three, let's talk about Demisi real quick. I didn't, I mean, I didn't, you know, want to cut off before we got to him, but we were just running out of time there. Um, you know, but the he like he just didn't play enough in Big Ten play to have a defining moment. But I think that in part is kind of his defining moment. Like I, to me, it's the Troy game. He had 14 points, two of four from three, four or five from two. You know, at that point, all the narratives about him really being a breakout guy, everybody's buying into him, even though his defense isn't that good. Yeah, and six rebounds too was yeah. I mean, the, and the reason why it's defining to me, and uh, you know, this is definitely going to be a backhanded compliment, but. You know, he can score points. Like, he is wired to score points. I think he can score a lot of points at lower levels of college basketball. He just may not be able to at the Big Ten. You know, and that's what he profiled as a as a high school player. And actually, in some of his appearances in Big Ten play, in perhaps the most ironic development of the season, he was more impactful as a defender than he was offensively. Because, you know, his shot wasn't really falling, and he just... He strikes me as a, a rhythm offensive player. And if he's going to get extended minutes, he can get into a rhythm. But, you know, he's just not at the point yet where you can give him extended minutes in Big Ten play. And so, you know, I don't know what that's going to mean for the for the rest of his career. But, you know, when you see him against some of these lower level teams, you see that offensive talent. You see the confidence. He's getting enough playing time to get into a rhythm. And, you know, now as he enters into the time when he's going to be an upperclassman and given the the wings that we're bringing in, it's hard to see where those minutes come from that are going to allow him to get into that rhythm. 
So I hope so. I love Demizi. You know, I want to see him be successful as much as any player because I like his work ethic. I think he has a great attitude. All of those things. But you kind of saw in Big Ten play this year, even on a team that you know you only had eleven guys, he got lost in the shuffle. You know, and so I don't again. I don't know what it means. Um, but that to me was his defining moment. Am I am I being too harsh? Did you guys have other ones? I, no, I mean those are that that game was one. I mean he played well in some of those games earlier in the year, but I I really don't think I had. Uh, probably in the at the time would would have thought about it, but really looking through the game log of of just how much his minutes dropped off and how little he you know how many games he just didn't even play in in the Big Ten. Really, the only one after the Mar- the first Maryland game that he got more than four minutes was the Penn State game, and that was be- the the game at Penn State, and that was when Jerome was ill. Um, oh, and Race didn't play either, and yeah, Race was out, so it was kind of a you, you had to play at that point. And I, yeah, I think what you're saying is is probably fair. He just, for a guy who was really billed as a scorer and I think has that mentality, I think his ability to create his own shot at this level is limited. And then add to that the fact that this is a team that would have killed to have somebody out there who could space the floor and really shoot threes well. And to this point in his career, he's taken over 60% of his shots from three-point range and hit 23%. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about the shot mechanics and all those kinds of things. I think there's, there's validity to that, but he was also a guy who was able to use that and score, um, at, at the high school level, but size wise and, and things like that, I think it just becomes, um, uh, becomes difficult for him. And, and I agree with what you said, you know, a lot of the off season that the seniors who left were talking about him as a potential breakout guy based on how hard he worked and, uh, and things like that. But I just think that if you look at him compared to, you know, the, the natural comparison on the team this year was Jerome, uh, just from a size and maybe what you're looking for from a spot up shooter and, and wing uh, player, it, it, you know, Jerome's going to be the guy who gets the nod the vast majority of the time in that scenario. And then you look at bringing in a Jordan Geronimo and Trey Galloway is kind of a little bit in that same. I, I just think from a positional standpoint, yeah, we'd like to see IU maybe play small more than they have, but I, it, it's hard to see him. It feel like he's not getting squeezed a little bit from a positional standpoint. Let me just jump in real quick. No, no, we're going to go to coach. No, um, D- Demisey was recruited in the first recruiting class uh, when Archie was really trying to get Indiana guys. Uh, and he also was a shooter, and I think Archie knew, as we've seen for the last couple of years, that there hasn't been good shooting. Uh, and, and sometimes in recruiting, you take a chance to get him on campus and see what you can do with players like that. Uh, you've seen the next few years a little different type of player being recruited in, uh, but one, you wanted to get into the state of Indiana, you wanted to get up north, uh, he was the right size because uh, you see Archie going for six four, six five, six six guys. You're, you know Archie wants shooting. He, he's not having teams that can't shoot on purpose. Um, and I think once Demise got into it, the game was the game was just a little bit too fast for him uh, at this level, or at least it has been in his first two years. Can he? Uh, can the game slow down for him defensively and offensively, where he plays instead of thinks? If he sticks around at Indiana, we'll see. Uh, but boy, there's going to be a lot of players at, at his position, you know. And I think it's telltale when Jerome comes in and plays a lot more than Demise after sitting out a year, and when Demise did not sit out a year. I think that just speaks to, um, you know, where he is. I think your comment is either in the run sheet or whatever that maybe he's better at a mid major or a different level of basketball. It doesn't mean he's not a good young man. And, and I do praise him for being up on the bench and no, no negative, you know, not a problem in the locker room and all of those things. Cause it's hard when you're not playing, but um, yeah, I just think the the big 10 college game is has shown to be too much for him and he's need to progress to where it's not, or, or he's not going to play. Yep. All right. Well, let's, uh, Let's move on here to segment three. We've got six minutes, 27 seconds, so I will keep you guys updated in the chat for how All we're right. doing. And we will move on here. We'll get the uh, we'll hit that one question that I teased, and then we'll get Jay's. Okay. Here we go. It's Ethan Happ. And I never listen to the assembly call. 
especially the episodes that Ryan is on. Glad you were listening tonight, Ethan. Welcome back to the Assembly Call. I am Jared Morris. I'm here with Coach and with Andy Bottoms. And remember that you need to be subscribed to our email newsletter. We send out a weekly IU News Roundup, even during the offseason. And after every game, we send out a detailed post-game analysis. Just text IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com. That's IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com. All right, guys, time for the mailbag. All these questions submitted via our private IU basketball discussion community, which is what Coach teased uh, earlier in the show. It's assemblycall.com slash community. We still have a ton of good stuff going on there in the off season. So if you're looking for a place to kind of, you know, get some connection with fellow IU fans, it's a great place to go. Come join us. Um, let's hit uh, this question from Jim Tom Hoosier, who says, how ready do you think next year's recruits are to provide meaningful minutes? And it's good timing for this because the chat mob has been talking about this for the last 20 minutes with a lot of good insight in there. Uh, coach, what do you think? How ready are these guys going to be to play? Well, I, I'm hoping they're fantasy type ready where fantasy comes in as a freshman and plays early in the scrimmage and everyone's like, he needs to play because I think, uh, the shooter in Leo and the toughness in Galloway and the Geronimo's athletic ability, there's a lot to be hopeful for that. Some of those guys might be Armand Franklin, which play when they're hot and then have a run where three or four games where they don't. But I do think there's enough there that you're going to see different guys at different times. The one guy I'm, I'm just maybe have the rose colored glasses on is Galloway because of, of how many times I've said toughness and diving on the floor and aggravating the, the one of the better players on the other team by playing defense and rebounding. So I, if I had to pick one that will, I think play a little bit more, uh, I think it's Trey Galloway because of, of the defensive side and then maybe um, the best of Leo and Geronimo for offensive ability. And Leo has <clears throat> kind of the, the lead because of his ability to pull up and, and hit an open three. Yeah, I mean, if Trey can shoot, he is definitely going to get a lot of minutes. You know, that's the thing that could really get him on the court even more. But we know he'll defend and he can be a playmaker and there's always going to be a spot for, for guys who can do that. Andy, what are you what are you kind of expecting from those guys? And that this you know, hopefully Lander is a guy who's in that class too and can come in and play. Yeah, I think the yeah, the Lander one is 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 a hard one because I and you guys have talked about this. I don't know that I've been on too many of the shows where where he has come up specifically, but it's definitely one where you want to try to be cautious with a, a guy who would potentially reclassify and his age and experience in that scenario. He's been playing up from an AAU standpoint and all those kinds of things. But um yeah, you do kind of I think, I, I think all of them have skills that would allow them to to have a crack to earn minutes. I think it just becomes a matter of, uh, you know, what they can make out of those minutes. And and I I tend to align with Coach. I think um, I'll take them in the opposite order. I think Leo is the one where if you look at deficiencies from this year's team, he's the one that most clearly helps uh, uh, the shooting related deficiency. Um, so you, you could certainly make an argument that he's the guy, uh, who might be able to, to parlay some early minutes, play well and, and expand a role for himself. Um, but I think coach's argument about Galloway, just in terms of the, the toughness and defense, um, you could see that. And if he's a guy who can do the little things and you're getting good offensive contributions from another guy, from other guys, then maybe he fits in almost better because he's not, um, you know, his role is not to score at that point and, and strikes me as a guy, not, not that any of the others don't, but just strikes me as a guy who'd be willing to just do whatever it takes to win um, and be able to step into some of that. So some of the other guys can develop and really address the shooting component. Um, they can space the floor a little bit better than maybe the, the, the Leal key trait of shooting becomes a little bit less important. Okay, uh, this will probably be the last question that we can get to, and Jay is definitely going to be mad that we're saving it for second, but we are. It's not that good, but it's not that bad. It's Jay's Mediocre Question. All right, so Jay asked, what is your post-night era starting five of guys not from the state of Indiana or recruited by night? So the options here, and guys, I listed these on our run sheet. Bracey Wright, DJ White, Marco Killingsworth, Christian Watford, Victor Oladipo, Will Sheehy, Noah Vonley, Robert Johnson, Troy Williams, Nick Zeisloft, Thomas Bryant, put Max Bielfeld in there too, uh, OG Ananobi, Juwan Morgan, Marshall Strickland. I think those are those are the best players from out of state. I don't think I... I, I you could put Maurice Creek in there too uh, if you want to. Obviously, he didn't get to play as much at IU. Uh, but the starting five, it was tough, but I went with Oladipo and Robert Johnson as my guards. OG Ananobi and Christian Watford as my wings and DJ White as the big. And I was trying to put together the best 
kind of you know, the best lineup, not necessarily the guys who achieve the most. There just there aren't that many guards. There's a ton of big guys. Um, and then, you know, you kind of can mix and match the wings based on the style that you want to play. So we got about 30 seconds left. Uh, Andy, what's your starting five? Well, your inclusion of Robert Johnson is, is a good one. Uh, I, I would probably <laughs> stick largely with what you had. I mean, the, the couple that I looked at as potential would be Troy and Thomas Bryant, but I don't know. Yeah. Maybe you put Troy in just to give a different dynamic on the wing, but I think DJ White from a big, would, I'd, I'd give him the nod over Bryant. So those were the only two that I, others that I really looked at. Bryant, DJ White is the one I struggled with too. Because if you want to play, you know, like five out, you could put Bryant out there to have a guy who can shoot threes. But man, I went back and looked at DJ White's stats. God, he was so good. <laughs> Very underrated. <laughs> yes, Very his underrated. numbers are so, so good. All right, coach, we're going to have to get your thoughts uh, after uh, we do this on the podcast because that's going to have to do it for us on this week's episode of the Assembly Call. If you ever want to see us do the show live, join us at assemblycall.com on Thursday nights for the live broadcast of our Assembly Call radio recording. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Special thanks to Bob Thompson for producing a lot of the music that you hear on the show. And thank you for listening. We will talk to you Saturday night for the IU UNLV rewatch postgame show. Until then. Take it from me, James Blackman Jr. Keep your elbows in, eyes on the rim, and get buckets. Go Hoosiers. Thank everybody for coming out. All right. I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. I don't like carrots. <laughs> Coach does not like carrots. Coach, what is your... What is your starting five of players? I, I think you nailed the, the starting five. It just depends on what you want coming off the bench. You know, I, I like Sheehy for his toughness uh, and his yeah. attitude and his flexibility at Purdue. Um, uh, we mentioned Troy Williams and Thomas Bryant would come off the bench. You got to have Juwan uh, Morgan uh, as well. I'd probably yeah. have Zeisloft as a shooter. On the, yeah, on you the definitely and, want him on the team for sure. And this is where, again, it comes from your perspective because when Jared mentioned before the legacy of being a three- or four-year player at a school, uh, Noah Vonley's a great basketball player, uh, but he was there for one year, and I just skipped past him um, because of that. Um, Marco Killingsworth, again, again, I think a great basketball player, but wasn't at Indiana long enough for me to, to – to pick him over Morgan and uh, Troy and, and Sheehy. So th- yep. those were the guys I would add to complement that starting five. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to get Juwan on there, but, man, it was – when you start looking at OG and Christian Watford together as your wings, holy moly. <laughs> that's – Yeah. That is some that is some power right there and some defense. That would be that, – that lineup could defend, man. Oladipo, Robert – I mean, you know, they may – they could struggle in certain matchups, you know, just because, you know, Victor and Robert Johnson, especially as college players, did not have the tightest handle. And so you're probably going to have more turnovers that you want. Try scoring on that bunch. I didn't realize DJ White averaged like two blocks a game. I didn't realize he, I didn't, I forgot he was the shot blocker that he is. So anyway, DJ Marshall White, Strickland folks. is, is a forgotten guy a lot of times, isn't he? I mean, I think he had an okay career. He did. He had a if solid you're looking, career. If you're looking for a ball handler to to back up those guards, if you got a pressure situation, I yeah, I thought he had a, a a good career. He just got caught up at that time of year with Bracey Wright and all that kind of stuff. Where yep. you yeah, you don't really think highly of the group altogether. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we have a fun privilege tonight. We are doing something that we haven't done. When was the last time we did one of these? Like a year ago? Did we do them last off season? I think it might have been last off season that we did these. But yeah, it is I a, it was, yeah, I don't think it was any during the year. I think it was like in the in the summer, I feel like. Yeah, but we have a chat mob induction. Uh, and so obviously the chat mob, these are the folks that are here live to watch our YouTube show. Uh, and so, you know, oh my gosh, and he's got a Zoom background too. He came That's prepared, my ladies and gentlemen. Look at that. It is the great Richie Carter who is here. He's, you know, he's in the chat regularly. He comes to the tailgates. He was there, you know, when we were in town, he showed up for the meetup. Uh, to see everybody. And we really, really enjoy these opportunities. Um, and I know it's silly to do like inductions for the chat mob and all this stuff, but we wanted it to be fun. We want the folks who show up for our live shows to know how special we think they are. Um, and we do. So we wanted this to kind of be a special thing. And it's a fun opportunity for us to get to talk to you uh, and hopefully goad you into saying some ridiculous things that we can use later as drops, because that's really what the purpose of this show is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure I can it wasn't it, it wasn't originally but it's definitely become <laughs> that's that. what it's that is what it's become well richie thanks for coming on with us tonight man 
Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's start. Just tell us a little bit about your history just as an IU fan. Well, I've been an IU fan pretty much my whole life. Uh, my first mem- real memory of IU basketball was 87, of course. I'm born in 79, so I don't really remember a whole lot before that. Yeah. Uh, I do remember the 87 championship game. I do. Uh, my favorite memory is Cheney breaking the all time scoring record. With Were you there? From Bailey. I was not there. No. But my grandparents did have season tickets from 1971 when Knight's first year there until until they got old enough they couldn't go and then they just gave them up. Yeah. So I did get to go uh, quite a bit with them. That's awesome. So who is who's your favorite player of all time? Is it Calvert? Bailey. No, oh, Damon, Damon Bailey. Yeah. What was it about Calvert's Damon? Close second though. What was it about Damon uh, that you yeah, connected he, with? Just the fact that he came in as like a superstar, kind of like what people viewed Romeo as, as like a savior or going to push IU to the next level. Yeah. And the fact that he just checked his ego at the door when he came in and, you know, he accepted his role and did it to what Coach Knight asked him to do. And Mm -hmm. he was just a winner. Yeah, he was. So when, when did you find the assembly call? When did that become part of your Indiana uh, experience? About three years ago, like Kareem's last year, towards the end of his last season is when I found it. You, were, you were desperate I, for something? It's yeah, <laughs> a hell of a time to get on board. I know. Man, I, know. I, can't, I can't believe you stuck around listening to those shows. I distinctly remember us coming <laughs> yeah. on those shows and being like, God, this is the same show over and over again. Here's a truck getting ready to careen off a cliff. Can I hop on with you guys? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. great great timing. Good. Yeah. Hey, if you could survive those time and still stick around, that really says something about you. So who, yeah, it, was, who uh, it was a good time, you know, jumping in with the, on the live chats and, you know, just venting with everybody else about misery truly loves company that's that's definitely true and then uh, you know probably about a year ago this time i ran into coach and at a baseball game of all things and that started that and he invited me to come and join for tailgates and the rest is history as they say yeah yeah because every time every time he takes a video of the tailgates you are there hanging out and What's the best part about those tailgates? Uh, interacting and, meet, and meeting with everybody, and inter- yeah. you know the, the connections I made through Coach, and uh, you know I got to meet Rab Johns, Bykoff, uh, Sammy from Hoosier Huddle, the yeah. Malcolmson twins. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I've got to meet the Eric and Ward from Hysterics. It's just pretty <laughs> neat. And everybody yeah. that's all kind of like me, just a geek for IU. Yeah, Jared was really angling to get stories about Coach there. If you didn't pick up on that, that's why you really <laughs> no. Give us no. Well, give us a breakdown of Coach's general behavior at these tailgates. Let's get to the let's what, get to what the was chase. the one where Coach was really irrational? Was that the Michigan game when you guys oh, when yeah. it was like <laughs> really cold yeah, he, and you uh, guys were there all morning? He made it. He made it to the game and he seen like the first offensive series and the first defensive series, and he just. Disappeared. Nobody. Here I come, Mrs. Right. Stansoni. <laughs> Had to send a search party out to find him, and that was a mess. But Coach is a lot like Justin Smith when it comes to building a fire. He can be standing right on top of a fire pit, and he cannot put the cardboard in the fire pit to save his life. <clears throat> Oh, All right, Richie. That is not a sentence I was expecting to hear <laughs> tonight, gonna... but it was glorious. <laughs> All right, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt here. First of all, I'm, I'm a, I, I've been practicing this line with my family here. Richie is just one cool ass dude. That that that's just that it it started from the baseball game when when we met. He was a, standing up behind third base and he had his assembly call shirt on and he he just he didn't interrupt what I was doing. And then all of a sudden, I noticed there was a guy with an assembly call shirt. So I went over and introduced and and we've hit it off since then. And and here's. Here's the thing. There, he's a big IU fan. He goes to a lot of things, but he's also one of the first ones to our tailgates. He he uh, is willing to bring stuff, um, and he he's always there to help break down because there's a lot of tents and the bar and all of that things. He's really uh, he has a servant mentality, 
Uh, and I, I, I told my wife today about Richie being inducted on here and, and just how much I appreciate getting to know Richie in the last year. Uh, as a friend, I do consider him a true friend, even though he threw me under the bus for not being able to load the fire pit and uh, for, for passing out in the parking lot uh, after the first quarter. Um, but that's what good friends do. I, I cherish R- Richie just a ton um, because he's just a, a good person as well as a, a good IU fan. And I text him a lot and direct message him a lot. And, and anytime I'm down in Bloomington, I'm going to let him know. And Joel's, Joel's also a part of that tailgate stuff too. But, uh, Richie, thank you for, for walking into to my uh, universe down there and, uh, and, and just being a good fan, good friend too. And, uh, yeah. Thank you for opening it up and allowing uh, myself and everybody else in the chat mob to just swing by and be a part of it. That's awesome. I agree with that. And it was Richie, it was great meeting you. Um, you know, when we when we come up for for the meetups. I mean, you know, I know I say this a lot, but I really mean it. Like it, you know, fans like you are what make doing this special. And, you know, I've developed a reputation, I think, over nine years of doing the show of trying to keep things positive and, you know, always try to be supportive and stuff. And, you know, I don't I fail at that sometimes on the show. And it's seeing tweets from people like you and specific comments that you've made in the chat. Like you are positive, you know, and you embrace this team and always keep things in perspective and always, and whether it's the men's basketball team or the women's basketball team, the football team, like it always feels like you have something positive and uplifting to say about the individual players. And I draw a lot of strength to try to, you know, do that on this show from the example that people like you set. And so, you know, we wanted this to be a place where, you know, fans like you could congregate and feel comfortable and not feel like you always have to be getting down and getting negative and stuff. And so we, uh, we're, we're really fortunate that people like you are in the audience. So it's a, uh, it's good. It helps keep us grounded. It really does. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, there's enough negativity in the world that you got to find some sort of positivity. If you can't put a smile on somebody else's face, I mean, you've got to do what you got to do to, get through each day especially at times like this so yeah i thank you guys for doing what you do especially now and with the tournament rewatches that's pretty cool so i think you guys more than you know it shine a lot of light into people's worlds nowadays especially thank you thank you for saying that thank you did did you say you're originally from bloomington uh yeah I'm, i'm i live about 15 miles outside of bloomington uh, towards Spencer. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've lived down here. Like I said, my grandma worked at IU. I currently work at IU. My dad retired from IU. Oh man. It's a, it's uh, a legacy. It is. It it's is. In your, it's my in your blood. Currently works there. Yeah. So we, I mean, the only thing we've known is IU. The only thing I've known is IU. Yeah. And it's just, uh, uh it's just a, way out when times are rough to just watch sports and yeah take shots of uh (laughs) take shots of tequila that's good that helps (laughs) that's when that's when joel's around being a bad influence on everybody no it's not joel it's 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 our other friend isn't it isn't it it's not joel (laughs) joel will hardly do tequila Ooh. okay well, we know how we know how to challenge Joel next time we're up in town. Now, now we Joel know. Rick underneath the table when it comes to bourbon, but he won't need to do <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, he can. So, how how are you feeling about the the team and the program right now? What's your what's your overall thought? Uh, I think it's going in the right direction. It's taken longer than what I think people expected it to, but I think long term, Archie is the guy for the job. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how with everything going on in the world today and them not being able to be on campus and work out and all that, you're going to find out who has the will to be better and who doesn't. And I I just hope that Archie and the strength staff can put a program in place to, you know, make, make it to where they want to get better. And I think it's also a pivotal time with this going into Archie's fourth year I don't know. And if, with a new athletic director, will they take into account uh, his with the situation going on in the world today, whether that buys him another year if they struggle next year? Uh, but 
the cream will always rise to the top. So hopefully with the recruits we got coming in, uh, that'll be us. Yeah. And you are the president of a fan club, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Or you're at least a member of a fan club. I don't, have we determined the president? Are you are you claiming presidency I of that fan club? I appointed myself as president of the Jerome Hunter fan club. Yes. That's how this works. Okay. <laughs> I like I, it. Uh, I, I met uh, Jerome his very first year here on campus. He was living in Briscoe. And I got a buddy that works at Briscoe. So I happened to go over there and meet uh, Jerome. And I met Jake Forrester, too. And Jake, before he left, uh, we became really good friends. and. He told me that by the time it's all said and done, all said and done, Jerome will be something special. So, hmm. and, and I've not seen anything that will tell me otherwise. I mean, he struggled a little bit last year at the beginning, but I think we kind of expected that with sitting out a year and going through the major health issues that he went through. Yeah, but I think you've seen him turn the corner near the end of the season last year. Yeah, were you sorry to see Jake go? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, Again, I know some of the situations as to why he left, and I don't really want to yeah. air it out here. But uh, to me, I don't see what uh, Coach Miller did with – and you're comparing apples to oranges here, but Jerome's – or not Jerome, Trace Jackson Davis's body type and Forrester's were kind of the same. But what he was asking uh, Jake to do kind of – didn't make sense with what he had Trace hmm. doing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. But I think Jake would have been a good role player, a good four-year role player that the fans would have enjoyed by the time it was all said and done. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, he just had so much energy. So I agree. It would have been nice to see how he would have developed. I yeah, did keep been... track of him at Temple next last year, and he did fairly decent at Temple. So Yeah, that's good. At least he's doing good yeah i think that what what you said about well, i think jerome when we talked about him i think what you said it, it's it's hard to believe you. like you've had him around for two years but you forget that he's really only played for one year and so everybody has these expectations and stories of like oh here's what we should expect out of this guy and like you really realize okay he was really starting to round into things a little bit as last year came in the way a lot of freshmen really would but you don't think of him as a freshman because he'd, he'd been there a while. So yeah, I, he feels like the guy that will be talked about a lot is making the real leap that he's gotten his feet wet actually playing college basketball. Cause I just don't e- even a normal red shirt freshman. I don't think he was able to get the, the benefit of, you know, that I, I know Dustin wrote about the couple of Purdue guys that red shirted this past week. And it's like, there's tangible benefits that they are talking about from having done that. Like, I don't know that he got those benefits cause he was just working through the medical situation the whole time as opposed to doing some of those other things. So yeah, he's a guy I'm looking forward to. It's exciting to think that you've got three more years of him, even though you don't really think of it that way, given that he's been, he'd been around for two years already. Yeah. Hey Richie, which, which of the incoming freshmen, let's take Lander out of it because you know, Lander's the, the, the top uh, recruited or ranked guy, but of the three that are signed right now that we know for sure are coming, which, which player are you looking most forward to seeing uh, wear the Indiana uniform next year? I'll be honest. I've not really had a chance to study him a whole lot, but I hear a lot about Lil because he's here in town. Uh, I do like you – know, I, I talked to Joel quite a bit, and Joel seems to be at, at keeping on him. And I think that if Trey's as tough as they say he is, I think Trey will be the impact freshman next year. But I think uh, Lil will be uh, – I think Lil will be there too. Geronimo, I don't know a whole lot about. I, I hear he's kind of freakishly athletic. So I'm hoping he can arrange that to be kind of like a Vic type player within a year or two. So, I mean, they all got their, uh, their points that I think will help the team in the long run. Hmm. If you ever got the chance to ask Archie a question, what would you ask him? <laughs> Well, have you, like, in a private moment, I mean? Not necessarily, like, a public moment, but, like, a private moment where you would actually get a candid answer from him that you might not share with other people, but you could actually ask him a real question. What would you ask him? That's tough. I don't know. Uh, 
Why do you I mean, sit guys a, when they get their second foul in the first half? Oh, boy. <laughs> that is a good question. I mean, because someone needs to ask that at a press conference, dang it. I have never really paid attention to that. I know you tweet about it a lot, but going back and watching these re, re games, uh, Knight would leave players in there after they got their second foul. And I guess a lot of it just, he doesn't have the trust in them yet, maybe. I don't know. I mean, that is a good question. I don't know if it was one I would ask or not, but no, no, no. Please really save it. Know. Please save it for a better question. If you get that opportunity, ask yeah. <laughs> that. That I'm should be sure asked at a press would. conference. Yeah, I'll probably never <laughs> yeah. I saw that stat today that I that I mentioned you and Jared, and I was like, oh boy, if you ever see this, they're what like almost three hundredth in <laughs> yeah. in like willingness to play guys with two fouls. So yeah. I we. We're going to do a show on that because I actually have more nuanced thoughts on it than I sometimes let on. We need to do a whole show on it because it would actually be a pretty good discussion. Um, and here's a question for you, Richie, that, that we definitely need an answer for because he's not here. So what do you really think about Ryan? <laughs> well, that's a loaded question. Uh, I was kind of sad he wasn't going to be here because I was wanting to him to give. I was wanting for him to interrupt me. I don't know what I would have <laughs> done, but. I Let me just jump in real quick. <laughs> yeah. He's here. But, no. He's here in spirit. Uh, Will this like be on the Brian. podcast? No, it's not on the podcast. Just on <laughs> YouTube, Brian. <laughs> I, I'm a fan of Ryan's. I like giving him uh, crap on Twitter, you know, occasionally, especially about Madeline. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ryan is, uh, he's definitely, he likes to interrupt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jared's fishing for drops right now, Richie. No, that's what he's that's doing. No, he's fi- that is- no, no, he's fishing for drops. So be careful, my right. friend. No, my oh, fishing, are- my, my fishing is done. He already said he already compared you to Justin Smith. Yeah, we we yeah. got all we needed. <laughs> you're you're still welcome at the tailgate, Richie. I still love you, man. But I yeah, was, I was going to be there whether you welcomed me or not. <laughs> <laughs> he's part. He's part of the team, man. Yeah, he's just going to be there. Um, okay, so let me, let me ask you one more question. Football wise, let's say, let's assume that football is going to happen. I saw some ranking, I don't know what it was, that had Indiana 16th in, the, in a preseason ranking. It might, I think it was some computer model or something, but 16th. How excited are you for the upcoming football season? Again, assuming I'm very it happens. I'm excited for the upcoming football season. Uh, my biggest question is can Pennick stay healthy? That's, yeah. To me, that's the key. If he's not, if he's going to be made of glass and he can't play, uh, we're going to be in trouble. I mean, I, I've heard a lot about this uh, this Dexter Williams kid that's coming in as a quarterback. He's a true freshman. I hear he's really good, but I don't know. I mean, to, the key to this team is going to be if Penix can stay healthy or not. Yeah. No, I agree with you. That kid has so much talent. If he can stay healthy with WAP and all the other guys that they have, man, they got a chance to be pretty good. And what they got coming back on defense, they should shouldn't be any fall off on defense. No, Taiwan Mullen, he's going to be all Big Ten this year, so got a chance that to be fun. That guy is going to be probably the best defensive player to ever play at IU before it's all said and done. And I've whoa actually had a chance to inter- interact with him at uh, IU women's games before, and he's got a nice head on his shoulders. He's a pretty straight laced kid. Yeah. Hmm. Hey, Jared, there's something else that I think uh, the people should r- recognize about Richie, too, is that he is a true Indiana University fan, um, and, and a lot of us are, uh, and we can say that a lot about a lot of us, but he goes to the women's games. Uh, I've been to a volleyball game with him, uh, and I know that he's been at baseball, football, basketball, and, and that is, you know, um, that's something that I admire from from afar. So thanks, Richie, not only for appreciating us at Assembly Call and IU Basketball Hoosiers, but thank you for being a true Hoosier. Uh, it's it's what makes Indiana University um, sports and athletics just special as people like you. I agree with that. It it helps that I get free tickets too. So <laughs> <laughs> can a brother get some coupons? <laughs> Just got to show my work badge, and I get two free tickets to everything except for men's basketball and football. So. Yeah, that works out pretty well. And there's been but a you lot take of... the time to go. Yeah, I you do, still take yeah. the time to go and, yep. and support. And, and, and normally, a lot of those athletes normally, need it. Yeah, and normally I end up paying for my tickets. Anyway. I mean, I'll get 
my two, and then I usually either give those away to somebody, and then I'll buy other ones or yeah. something like that. I usually pay it forward. So. so who's your favorite women's basketball player? Grace Berger, hands down. <laughs> You're fan club president of her too, right? I am. Yeah. yeah. She has the best mid, mid-range basketball game, men's or women's, of anybody in the country. I firmly believe that. That was the first thing I thought of when she came up was like, she's got a good mid, mid-range mid shot for sure. So, yeah, And her basketball IQ is really good. So here's a, here's a question for you. Which, if you could have had only one NCAA tournament played to see how far they would have gotten, men's or women's, which one would you have rather mm-hmm. seen? Yeah. I figured you I figured you would answer that. Is that because you thought you think they would have gone further or you just like their that team better Yeah, this I year? think they had a they had a true final four potential, I believe. Yeah. I mean, they were the only team to beat South Carolina that was number 1 in the country. So, I mean, if, on a, on a given night they could beat anybody. What are people missing who don't watch the women's team play as much as they watch the men's team play? You know, uh of course, Joel and I go to a lot of the men's games and a lot of, and we go to all the women's games. Uh, the women's games are just a lot more entertaining because I guess the men, you want the men to succeed so much that they just get frustrating at times to watch. And, you know, uh, Jared, I'm sorry, but Devontae is the biggest pendulum on the men's team. Hey, as far as no argument for me there. <laughs> and, but I, I think just the women's team, they play as a team. They don't care who has the stats. I mean, you can watch a women's game, and before you know it, like in the second quarter, you look at the scoreboard, and Allie Patberg might have eight points and nine assists. But there's like five players that's all got like eight points or more. They're just balanced. They they, they remind me a lot of the night coach teams where wow. there's no egos. Everybody just does their job, and who's ever on that night carries the ball. Wow. That's a yeah, they, strong endorsement. I mean, what what struck me when we went and I took my family this year over, um, I guess it was Christmas. It, it was, I mean, there was a good, a good crowd there the night that we went. And I think it was the night they had dollar tickets or whatever. So it was a pretty good, it was a pretty good crowd against Michigan State. And and but even outside of that, just like the emotion and togetherness that the team seemed to have, and Pat Berg was a big part of that. But like. And I think some of that is true in some of these sports where there aren't as many people in the stands where it's it's kind of hard as a men's player to not get up for a big game in assembly hall because you know everybody's going crazy and things like that. I'm sure you'll we'll, we can all think of games this year that that didn't happen, but let's just kind of but but I think a lot of times the women's team like has to supply their own energy and excitement, and the crowds are getting bigger and bigger over the course of the year. And I think there are folks like like Richie who are going to a lot more games than there used to be, but I think they just. Like they brought their own energy. They almost didn't need anybody else to like get them amped up for the game. Um, and just the kind of level of togetherness and encouraging everybody. Like I was really struck by that being there. We talk a lot about body language on the bench and all that kind of stuff. Like it was, it was awesome. You could tell they really, really like each other um, and are really pulling for each other. And um, it, it was, it was really cool to watch it. It, it, kind of reeled us into a point where just going to one game, we would watch if we would happen to see it on. Like we would, you know, my kids would seek it out to see like, Hey, when are they going to be on and whatever. They're really kind of magnetic personalities. It felt like where they really drew people in. It's awesome. And to get to a game, haven't had a chance to, to get to a game when we've been up there, but I definitely, they should be really, really good next year. Yeah. As if they weren't good enough this year, but well, good. Well, Richie, thanks for doing this, man. This is a lot of fun. It's uh, you know, we we go. It's so long in between actual meetups, and we all get to hang out. So that's one of the fun parts about doing these in the off season. It's a good chance to get to see familiar, friendly faces and talk with you about basketball. So I appreciate you staying up late and it hanging out with lot. us. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, this is um, no longer a podcast virgin, I guess. So I hope you guys are satisfied <laughs> as I am. There's a drop for you, Jared. <laughs> Man, I'm just, I'm still, I can't get the over gap what between, you said. The gap between the one about Coach B and the Justin Smith of starting a fire and whatever yeah. else you would say is going to be huge regardless. But that that will be a good second place. I still can't get over what Richie said earlier, and I'm really starting to worry about what I've done to my credibility that a longtime listener has to apologize to me before saying that Devontae Green is a pendulum swing. Okay? Like <laughs> well, I, I asked you. really what put what yourself I, out there this what year. I done? So, you know. <laughs> what have I done? Poor judgment, Jared. Where's your basketball IQ? <laughs> What have I done? <laughs> you know what? Sometimes it 
my uh my desire to see the best in these guys gets in the way of objective analysis. That has been the battle since we started the show, and I just you know, but the heart I wants mean, what it wants, Jared. What can you do? <laughs> it's true. Well, in your defense, though, Jared, I think everybody wanted Devonte to succeed because we felt that if he succeeded, then the team was going to be better because of it. Yeah, so that is true. Going out there on that limb, even all by albeit you was by yourself, uh, <laughs> I commend you for going out there. Hey, Brendan Quinn from the Athletic had Devonte preseason third team All Big Ten, so it wasn't just me, not just you guys me. Are drinking the same water, <laughs> it was two of us. <laughs> hey, but Richie, if if that limb fall, fell and broke, I could probably get that into the fire pit. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> uh, well, hey man, last question for you: Is there anything that we could do better that you would like to see from us? You know, just in terms of our coverage or what we do or anything like that? No, I think you guys do a tremendous job. I really do. Uh, again, especially in times like we're going through now, the you guys allow, I mean, we're going on probably two hours here. And you guys have taken two hours that we as chat mob people and IU fans don't have to worry about what's going on in the world. We can take our mind off that and just you know, talk about something that we find uh, positive and energetic and a lot of fun to talk about. So I think as far as that goes, that's more than enough. That's awesome. That is awesome. Thanks for saying that. All right. Now, the the last thing, and I just thought of this, but we need to start doing this. So we're going to start doing this with chat mob folks who come on here because we do it with players. We've got to get an elbows in, eyes on the rim, and go Hoosiers. So we need to take it from me, Richie Carter. Or call yourself Damon Bailey if you want to. Maybe maybe we should have people do it. Pretend as their favorite player. Do it. Do it. However, <laughs> however, however you want to do it. But we want we want to get we want to get a read because then we can use those at the end of the show as well. If you're comfortable, if you feel comfortable doing it. Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Take it from me, Coach Tomsoni's sidekick. Keep your elbows in, your eyes on the rim, and go Hoosiers. All right, <laughs> that's awesome. Coach Tonsoni's sidekick. <coughs> that is great. All right. I'm honored. I went I'm honored. Out honored too. <laughs> the story. The story was I was throwing paper and fire and firewood into the fire pit after a few and beverages, and I kept missing. And Richie just fell off the bar stool laughing <laughs> as I'm trying to build this fire pit. I kept missing. And then you went for a rebound and burnt your hand. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we need Some video of this kids. next time. We need video. Wow. Every year I, I say, Richie. I, yeah, every year I say I'm gonna I'm gonna cut back and not get crazy, and then you guys show up, and Amanda shows up with her tequila. And, yep, and we all try to act like we're young again in college for that Saturday morning, and then then I'm face first out by the van at, in the first quarter of the Michigan game. You so it's dumbass. all it's all Hoosier Huddle's fault. <laughs> blame Hoosier Huddle. Exactly. That's the lesson. Yeah. It's all blame fault. blame Hoosier Huddle. All right. Well, Richie, thank you. Look forward to seeing you when we're up Thanks, there. Richie. Up yeah, there next you. week. And hey, thank you guys. Obviously look forward to seeing you in the chat mob for the rewatches and on Thursday nights. And by by the way, how what's your Twitter handle so people can follow you? It's at fire six two four. At and fire at, fire six two four. Yeah. I used to be a firefighter here in the county, so Oh, wow. Yeah. Very cool. Fire 624. Okay. Yeah. Well, Richie, have a good night. Coach, Andy, yeah. have a good, who's on uh, Saturday right, night? Peace. It's Andy, uh, Ryan, and Galen? And Galen, I believe. Galen, yeah. okay. Yep. All right. Cool. Thanks for hanging out with us, Richie. It was uh, sure. awesome chatting with you again. Stay safe. Stay healthy down there. Peace, We're brother. Doing our best. You guys have a good night. And yep. Stay safe yourself. Yeah. All right. See everybody. Right. Good night. Take care, everybody. Talk to good you guys night. on Saturday night. All right. Sounds good. See y'all. See you, Richie. See you.